So morning, everybody. So let me first ask you all to switch off your phones or put them on flight mode so we don't get interruptions. So it's nice to see that some of you survived last night's dinner. I hope you enjoyed it and everything was fine. So the first speaker of today is Thomas Bell from Imperial College, London, please. Working? Excellent. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks very much for uh, showing up after last night's dinner. Hopefully you weren't out uh, too late. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, ecosystem functioning in, in miniature systems. Uh, I wanted to thank the organizers for inviting me. I was here eight years ago, and eight years ago I also warned them that I'm not actually a theoretician, so I wasn't sure what I would contribute. Uh, but hopefully some of the empirical studies that I'll be talking about today uh, will give some, some food for thought for the sorts of questions that theoreticians are tackling at the moment. Uh, and uh, also wanted to thank the, um, uh, the funders. Uh, this, this was work that was carried out over a number of years, was funded by European Research Council, by the Royal Society, and by the Natural Environment Research Council. Uh, so I, I, I work on a, a bit of a toy system. Um, uh, which uh, takes a little bit of explanation because it's probably not one that you've encountered before. Um, so this is a beech tree. If you're unfamiliar with beech trees, it's quite an old tree. And uh, one, one feature of these rather old beech trees is that they retain this smooth bark, um, even as, as, uh, as old trees. And another feature is that because they're quite a, a shallow rooting species of tree, that you get this buttressing at the base as they age to stop them from toppling over. And this combination of features means that when it rains, and it's recently rained here, the rain comes down the trunk of the tree and it collects in the buttressing at the base to form these little pools of rainwater. And uh, these water-filled tree holes have been the subject of my study uh, for the last uh, 15 or 20 years. Um, and really what we're interested in them, why we're interested in them, is not because we're necessarily particularly interested in this rather esoteric system, it's because we're interested in using them as model systems for understanding microbial ecology. And uh, they have a bunch of really nice features. One of the nice features is that we can go out into a woodland and we can go and find dozens or even hundreds of these water-filled tree holes uh, so they're relatively accessible. It's not like sampling rivers or lakes where you need to travel around the countryside and maybe sample a handful within a day. Here we can go out and sample lots and lots of them. Uh, another nice feature is that they're, they're clearly a natural system. Uh, so the stuff that's going on within those systems should be, if, if, we, if, if we have any hope for generalizations, the stuff that happens there should be generalizable to other systems. <clears throat> and another nice feature is that the energy entering into this system is relatively homogeneous. Uh, there's not much primary productivity because if there's lots of sunlight, then the, the water-filled tree holes dry up and so you don't see them anymore. So these are relatively shaded systems without much primary productivity and the energy entering into the system is mostly in the form of the beech leaves that fall down into, the water, in, 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 into these rain pools. So we have a single resource base that's of course quite a, a complex set of substrates but is nonetheless one that's actually easy to replicate within the lab um, and what i've been interested in is trying to understand the functioning of these systems uh, mostly involved in in degradation of the leaf litter so what are the sorts of processes that determine the rate at which degradation happens which substrates are used and how the uh, the bacteria in particular that are feeding on these substrates uh, interact together to determine these ecosystem rates. Uh, and we've been studying this in the field to some extent, but we've also brought this system into the lab. Um, so as I said, it's, it's a nice system because um, we, can, we can mimic the resource base, and when we bring it in the lab, it's not too far removed from the actual system. It's not like taking a little bit of of lake water where you have a few milliliters of lake water and you say, okay, this represents a, a, a lake that's a few kilometers square. This is a you know, 10, 100 milliliter system is actually something that's similar to the natural system that we can have in the lab and that we can control. 
Um, so we've been doing all kinds of experiments. A lot of these experiments are with uh, Tim Barclough, who's at uh, Oxford University at the moment. Um, and we've taken an approach that's probably familiar to, to many of you, which is to go into the system. We spread, take a sample a little bit of the water, spread that out on agar plates, uh, isolate uh, bacteria to create a, a library of strains, and then put those strains together in different combinations and measure ecosystem rates. Um, so in this, this is one of my very early microcosms. You can see there's a little tube inside the microcosm which has a little bit of sodium hydroxide in it. Uh, as the bacteria respire, the carbon dioxide reacts with the sodium hydroxide and you can do a titration at the end of it to see how much CO2 has been respired and use that as a proxy for decomposition rates. We have slightly more sophisticated ways of doing this at the moment. Uh, but the idea is the same, that we can create a microcosm uh, which has uh, a beech leaf media, so we boil up the beech leaves to make beech leaf tea, and then the bacteria are feeding on that tea. And uh, we, can, we can put together relatively complex communities using this approach. Uh, so one of, uh, this is from 2005, so this is sort of the dark ages uh, uh, during my PhD, where we manipulated the number of species in the communities and measured these uh, rates of degradation. In this case, the total amount of respiration that's coming off these communities. So this is an experiment that contained up to 72 species. Each of the little lines here is an individual combination of species. Um, so we have 72 one species combinations, monocultures, uh, a random sample of two species combinations and so forth up to, up to 72 species. And the, the black dots here are the, the means at each level of species richness. And you can see that on average, there's a linear increase uh, in the respiration. The species richness is in a log scale. So this is something that's slowing down. You get much more respiration with every increase in, uh, uh, in species richness at low levels of species richness than at high levels of species richness. Uh, but it's, it's something that's very predictable. And so, we can say we concluded from that that the diversity impacts these functional rates. And since then, we've sort of been exploring this and trying to understand why it is that you get this, this nice progressive increase in, in, in functioning as you increase the species richness. Um, like many of you, we've characterized the interactions that are happening within these communities. Uh, and uh, we did this in the following way. So we, we could grow up the monocultures of each of the species and then we compared that, we compared the amount of functioning that was happening in the monocultures to what was happening in the mixtures of the species. So if we had a black species that had some level of decomposition, a white species that had some level of decomposition, then we mix them together and we look at the outcome, how much decomposition we get when we have the combination of species, then there are a few different outcomes. It might be that they're antagonistic in some way, in which case, we would think that you'd get less decomposition than the sum of the parts, uh, or it might be that they're behaving in a completely additive way. Perhaps they have complementary niches or something like that, in which case you would get exactly the sum of the parts, uh, or it might be that you have some sort of synergy that's emerging. Uh, perhaps there's a positive uh, cross-feeding, some sort of feeding interaction that's happening, a processing chain perhaps, in which case you get more than the sum of the parts, some sort of synergistic interaction. Uh, the plot on the left here shows the outcome from that same 72 species experiment. On the y-axis, we have the amount of decomposition that we observed in, the, um, in these communities. And on the x-axis, we have the amount of decomposition that we would predict based on what's happening within the monocultures. The dotted line, sorry, the dashed line is the one-to-one -one line. And you can see that nearly all of the data points lie below that one-to-one -one line, meaning that we're getting less decomposition than we would predict from the monocultures. All of the, uh, nearly all of the isolates in this system are behaving in an antagonistic way with respect to this functional process that we're measuring. Uh, we've conducted more experiments where we've tracked what happens to these interactions over time. So this is a, a completely different experiment, one with many fewer species, uh, but similar idea where we constructed communities Using, uh, using different uh, uh, isolates from the same system. 
in the lab, um, we, in this case, we actually measured the impact of each of the species on each other. So on the x-axis, for all the pairs of species, we have the impact of one species on, on the other, and conversely, the impact of the second species on the first. Each of these data points is the average interaction that we have within each of the communities that are found within the microcosms. And you can see, so in the lower left quadrant are all the negative-negative interactions, in the upper right quadrant are all the positive-positive interactions, and top left and bottom right are the negative-positive and positive-negative interactions. Um, this is what happens, this is the picture of what these communities look like at the beginning of the experiment. And you can see that, as for the previous experiment, most of the interactions are antagonistic. And not only are they antagonistic, but they're actually negative-negative interactions. Um, one, one species is having a negative impact on the other, and vice versa. It's like a, a competitive interaction would be an example of a negative-negative interaction. So that's what's happening at the beginning of the experiment. What's happening at the end of the experiment is that you get a, a slightly different picture. The negative, the strong negative-negative interactions dissipate. Um, all of the data points move towards the origin. And you get, although you still get a preponderance of negative-negative interactions, they become weaker and weaker. Um, so we say that, although, so diversity impacts functioning due to negative interactions, but those negative interactions attenuate over time. Uh, we've done some experiments that have prolonged this even further so that we can look at not just ecological processes, acclimation and so forth, but also um, evolutionary processes. So this was an experiment uh, which ran for several months uh, where we uh, uh, tracked what was happening, in this case, just within four species communities. These are more difficult experiments to do, and so we could look at uh, just, a few, just a handful of species. Um, and uh, the, the way we ran this experiment was we either um, uh, allowed the individual isolates to adapt to the beech leaf tea on their own or as a mixture of four species. And we looked at how they evolved within this four species community. Um, here, this sort of network diagram shows you what those interactions look like at the beginning and at the end of the experiment. At the beginning of the experiment here, the I've got this the wrong way around, apologies. Uh, the blue lines are negative interactions and the red lines are positive interactions, so ignore that key. Uh, but uh, so the strong, at the beginning of the experiment, you see thick blue lines everywhere, indicating that as for all the other experiments that we do, when we take these isolates out of the beach, out of the tree holes, we put them into the microcosms. If we compete them together, then they're behaving in a negative antagonistic way. And this is confirmed at the beginning of this experiment too. Uh, and this is what happens at the end of the experiment, is that you get a completely different picture. Um, you see red lines begin to, to emerge, positive interactions emerge. Uh, we've characterized, we've tried to figure out why that happens. It seems to be that you do get some cross-feeding that emerges over a period of time. Uh, it looks like there's some, we've, we've done a little bit of metabolomics uh, on these communities to see that some metabolites are being produced by one of the isolates or being used by another isolate. Uh, it's not really what we do in the lab, but we have, we have a sense that there is a mechanistic basis to what's happening here. So diversity impacts functioning due to these negative interactions. Those negative interactions attenuate over time to the extent that over evolutionary time scales, they become positive interactions within this system. Um, and uh, a lot of what we've been trying to do there is to sort of add complexity to this. Um, so we've not only looked at how they evolve in these relatively simple consortia, um, but we've also looked at how they evolve when they're embedded within more complex communities. Um, so this was a system which was um, uh, developed by a postdoc of mine called Thomas Scherl. Um, this is a, um, uh, uh, a little, little bags, little capillary bags, which have tiny pores in them, uh, so small that they, um, uh, they don't allow passage of cells. So they're, they're used for their dialysis bags, which are used in protein purification. And what it means is that you can take an isolate, even one that hasn't been genetically modified, that doesn't have any sort of marker on it, 
We can put it into the bag, and it can sit in there. We can go and sample it and take it out of the bag, um, and we know that it'll be retained within there. It can evolve within the bag, and crucially, we can put it into a microcosm. We can suspend that bag into a microcosm, and it interacts chemically with anything that we put into the microcosm. So it's retained in the bag, but it interacts with anything that we might care for it to interact with. And what this means is that we can suspend focal isolates within a more complex community. Um, so uh, different, different colored circles here are different species of bacteria. You can take a focal isolate and you can put it in with a community that we've sampled from an actual tree hole. So not just culturable species, but also uh, you know, all, all, all the things that we aren't able to isolate in the lab. Uh, and uh, so we, we did this for uh, a f uh, qu quite a number of isolates. So the, the isolates that we, um, uh, that we used as focal species are in gray here. We used, um, these, these are, uh, this is uh, communities that are actually from the tree holes, 16S sequencing, um, normal sort of relative abundances that we find from 16S sequencing. And the, um, the grade are isolates that are actually, we actually see within the sequencing libraries. So Citrobacter, for example, is something that we both very commonly come across when we're, um, when we're sequencing the communities, and it's something that we isolate a lot uh, when we plate things out on agar plates. Um, and we also have a few species that we, uh, we don't really see in the sequencing libraries, but we pick up a lot on the plates. Um, so things that are there that are perhaps not as abundant within the actual tree holes, but do well within our microcosm system. So we had uh, 20 odd isolates and we had a few different uh, communities uh, with a gradient of, um, uh, of, of diversity within those communities. Um, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I think there were about 10 or so communities that were used within this experiment. And for all of these communities and all of these isolates, we took the isolates, we suspended them in the communities, and we allowed them to evolve over time. Um, this was uh, quite a laborious experiment, uh, very fiddly, uh, but the outcome can be summarized in, in this one figure, where we looked at the degree to which these isolates are able to adapt within these communities. Um, so on the x-axis here, we have the different communities, Eight of the communities uh, managed to survive. Two of the communities went extinct, so we didn't include them in this. And on the x-axis here, we have the different, all the different isolates that were the focal species that were caged within these bags. The red squares indicate that the isolates were able to adapt in the sense that they were outperforming the, ancest the ancestor in the beech leaf media. Um, and the blue square indicates that they became more maladapted, so they were growing less well in the beech tea at the end of the experiment. Uh, and I think some, something that's clear from this figure is that it's a little bit of a mess. It's not the case that if you just put these isolates into the beech tea, that they adapt to that media. Rather, it's the case that the degree to which they're able to adapt depends on the particular community that they're suspended in. So there's a lot of contingency in these communities. It's, the case, it's not the case that if you just have an environment, I mean, we think of you, you take an isolate, you put it into a new environment, give it enough time, it will adapt. In this case, that wasn't the case. In a lot of cases, they were actually constrained from, adapted, from adapting to these systems. Um, and so that, a lot of all of these experiments got us thinking about the utility of this sort of approach. How useful is it, is it to take these isolates out of their natural environments, um, uh, culture them, grow them up as pure cultures, and combine them into communities? Shouldn't it? Shouldn't we just be looking at the natural communities rather than putting together these very artificial consortia? Um, common criticism, you know, lots of Lots of the isolates that we're using in these communities, um, uh, uh, sorry, lots of the bacteria that are found in these tree hole systems can't be cultured, can't be isolated. So perhaps we're looking at a very biased subset of what's actually available. Um, and I think some, 
something that's apparent from this last experiment is that often the dynamics that we see don't necessarily reflect what's happening in the natural system. If the degree to which something adapts depends on the complexity of the surrounding community, then we need to reflect that in the experiments that we're doing. Um, so we've been doing quite a lot with, uh, with the actual communities, trying to come up with similar sorts of simple experiments that we can do in order to understand how the, func how the functional processes work within these systems uh, using more complex um, uh, communities. Uh, so this was uh, uh, a large survey that we conducted a few years ago now. Damien Rivet, Rivet was postdoc at the time. He's uh, now a lecturer at, in, in Manchester. Uh, and he went out, a uh, heroic effort, and sampled lots and lots of tree holes around the south of the UK and into Cornwall, um, and uh, visited 20 different sites, sampled uh, 750 tree holes. We tried to get him to get to 1,000, but it was just too much. I think it crushed him. Um, and the, what we've done with these uh, is that we didn't, want to, well, we didn't want to study them in situ because the problem with studying them in situ is that every single environment is a little bit different. You know, different insects will fall in, perhaps one tree hole will have a fox that's drunk from it, and so the dynamics will be a little bit different. And we could spend a lifetime just trying to understand how the local environmental variables are influencing um, uh, the communities that we see there. So we went out, we, we got those, we sampled those tree, tree holes, took those samples and froze them down as whole communities. So we have those communities then in the freezer that we can revive and do things with. And it's certainly the case that some things die during that prior preservation, so we don't capture everything, but at least we have a starting, a standardized starting community that's reasonably complex, that reflects the natural system that we can do experiments with. Uh, we've sequenced these using 16S sequencing. This was uh, uh, an effort led by Alberto, who's at ETH Zurich at the moment. Um, this is an ordination of all those communities. So each of the dots here is an individual community. He applied some algorithms to detect clustering within this principal components analysis. Um, and each of the colors here is a, um, is a, a cluster of points. Some of them are overlapping each other, but if you looked at other dimensions within this multidimensional space, then they segregate on those other dimensions. So we can identify that there are different categories of communities and um, which have you know, characteristic compositions. In this case, we found that there are six different community classes that we could identify based on this ordination clustering approach. Um, and what we've done since then is we've tried to figure out the degree to which those are actual real entities, whether the differences that we observe within the communities actually reflect different functional categories of, uh, of, of community. Uh, we can um, impute the genomes using pie crust. So each of the uh, rows here are genes, each of the uh, columns are communities. Um, uh, blue are genes that are overexpressed. Red is uh, sorry. Red genes that are overexpressed. Blue is genes that are underexpressed. Uh, and uh, very complex picture. Uh, we can do an ordination on those um, uh, on, on those uh, gene gene categories. And what you can see. So this is ordination now, not of the 16S data, but of the imputed metagenomic data. Uh, what you can see is that, to, some, to a large extent, the community classes are retained. So we have, uh, so when we do an ordination with the metagenomic data, the clustering of the community classes is, is still there. So the different community classes have reflect divergent metabolic strategies. There's some circularity here because obviously we're using the 16S data to get the metagenomic data. Um, but something that's really nice with this sort of system is that we can actually conduct functional assays with those communities. We have them in the freezer, so we can take them out and we can see what their metabolic capacities are. So that's something that we did. So we go into our frozen living archive and we conduct metabolic assays. And long story short, 
this is what we get. Uh, so we assayed them for their capacity to degrade a number of different substrates. We did a few other assays as well, but this is, this is one of the highlights. So the ability to degrade hemicellulose, chitin cellulose, and monoesters, which we thought were important substrates within this system. And um, the, the red is a greater ability to degrade those substrates. The blue is uh, a worse ability to degrade those substrates. And what you can see, and on the, in the columns here, these are averages within each of these community classes. And you can see that there are some classes that are able to degrade everything well. There are some classes that are specialists on particular substrates and so forth. And so it's not just, it's, these community classes are not just figments of our imagination. They're not just clusters in ordination space. They actually reflect divergent functional capacities. Um, we've taken a different approach as well, where we've tried to have a look at what the, um, uh, uh, what the OTUs are doing within these uh, communities. So not just to do ordin ordinations, but to actually look at co-occurrence networks. Uh, so I'm sure it's an approach that's familiar to many of you, is just to look to see which of the OTUs within our OTU matrix are, are positively or negatively correlated, and to use those associations to constru construct um, to construct networks where the nodes are the OTUs and they're um, uh, attached together by edges which indicate the degree to which they have correlated abundances. And we use patterns of correlation, patterns of, uh, 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 we use the, the clustering pattern that emerges to try to identify functional groups and ecological guilds with these, within these networks of association. So this is what the, the co-occurrence network looks like for our tree hole communities. Um, and we've tried to cluster these together according to, uh, to nodes, to OTUs within this network that, um, uh, that, have, uh, uh, that are more clustered within themselves than with other parts of the network. So the different colors reflect uh, different, uh, uh, different functional groups. And again, we're thinking about, okay, there are lots and lots of studies that do this sort of things. But does this actually reflect something that is real? How do we go about testing to see whether these functional groups are, are actually things that are important in the ecology of these systems? And so Matt Jones had done some experiments where we actually take these intact communities and invade them with, with isolates that aren't actually present within the tree holes. And we look to see the degree to which the functional groups that are found within these, um, uh, these tree holes are important in resisting those invasions. Um, so this is just, a, we, we conducted this experiment with two different invaders, uh, Pseudomonas fluorescens and Pseudomonas putida. We put them in a, at relatively high titers and they tended to decline over the course of the experiment. So this is more like a survival experiment. So they go in, and we measure the degree to which they're able to survive within the microcosms. And I guess the bottom line is that, uh, so this is the degree to which uh, Pseudomonas fluorescens uh, survived within these microcosms. And the strongest predictor of survival was the, um, uh, the, the biomass, the accumulation of the resident community. But the second strongest prediction, predictor was the presence of one of these functional groups. The degree to which functional group four, whatever it was, was abundant within the community that we we're inoculating these invaders into. If we looked at things like the diversity of the communities, the phylogenetic diversity and so forth, these were think, things that were of very minor importance. So we think that these functional groups are, are real things which are determining the ecologies of, of, of these systems by, in this case, excluding invaders from them. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's a little bit of a straw man to say, okay, you know, the uh, uh, experiments using isolates are, are unimportant, uh, but uh, I think what we've shown is that there's a nice complementarity between doing experiments using isolates, building consortia, trying to figure out exactly what the interactions look like, but then contrasting that with the real systems that we, that we have um, in, in nature and trying to see um, both how they're similar, how the results of those experiments are similar and how they're different. Um, and I think what, have, what we've been trying to do is to develop this, 
this way of doing ecology where we don't go out into, into the environment and try to find all the environmental correlates of the community structure that we observe, but rather to build it from the bottom up, as it were, to take the communities as they appear in these natural systems and look for patterns within, within those communities, look for structure, look for functional groups, for guilds, for, um, uh, uh, for clusters in ordination space, and then try to see whether those clusters have any, uh, um, uh, have, have any ecological or evolutionary implications. Thank you very much. Thank you for this nice talk. Are there any questions? This one here. Uh, good. So the question was whether we, uh, for the co-occurrence networks, or whether we also put together some random communities. Uh, no, we didn't. So these were just the intact communities. So these were based on the 750 intact communities. So we don't have a, a null comparison that was completely random. So there was one more here. So the, the question was, um, how many environmental drivers of the real system do we include in the lab system? Um, I think there we try to simplify as much as possible while keeping some degree of realism, and it's a little bit of a knife edge. You know, we, we don't want it to be so simple as to be trivial and to be completely divorced from the system, but we don't want it to be so complicated that it's, um, uh, uh, that it's difficult to understand. And, and also I think, like we don't, we don't necessarily want to precisely mimic what's happening in the real system. Uh, that's it's it's a little bit different uh, in to, to that in that degree to say having a a mouse model or something like that, where you are really trying to capture the dynamics of what's happening in that system. We're just interested in how these communities behave um, when you feed them relatively complex substrates, and whenever they're coming into that system, they're you know they're shifting around their composition to adapt to. To the lab environment, but we think that it's it is you know, from the complexity of the resource base. It's something that's um, that that mimics what's happening in the, in in nature. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so, so the, the, the question was um, that in the, in the natural system, you have continual influx of, uh, uh, of new substrates. Uh, so we do mimic that to some extent. So some of the experiments, the shorter term experiments that we do is a batch culture where they just uh, break down the substrates that's there. And, and we see actually that over the course of the experiment, they're more and more reliant on more recalcitrant substrates. So there is a sort of successional process that happens there. For the longer term experiments, we do refresh the substrate when we sample. So we'd sample 10% of the community and replace that with fresh media. So there is a deg degree of influx. Uh, and we do have done, we've done experiments where we've um, um, changed, you know, looked at impacts of temperature. We haven't tried to mimic the diurnal set cycle, but we have looked at them in divergent temperatures to see what the degree to which that makes a difference. Um, so I, th I think we've, we do, try to mimic these things sort of one at a time, but not to build a system that is a tree hole in the lab. We just want a, a, a puddle of complex substrates that they're adapting to. Um, so that's time for two short questions. There was one down there and then Stephanie, and maybe Jeff, you start setting off. Uh, so it's it's both. So we, we measure 
in that experiment, we measured the, the respiration by just um, uh, using this titration method. So everything that was respired from a community was um, uh, reacting with the sodium hydroxide. So it's like a cumulative amount of CO2 that's respired over a period of time. So it's, so it's a rate as well. Um, the time was fixed. Yeah, yeah. And so, so the what the antagonistic interaction means is that you just get less respiration over that period of time than you would expect from the monocultures. So, short question. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is just uh, if for those of you who are here for Catherine Coit's uh, talk yesterday, we get the reverse dynamic. So she was talking about how you get positive interactions at the beginning and then those become negative over time. We see the reverse. Um, so positive interactions are generated. We think what's happening is that you have one uh, of the isolates which is pre adapted to the media and is managed to monopolize the dominant substrates and the other things adapt to the breakdown products of that. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. And our next speaker is Jeff Huishman from Amsterdam, and he was actually here also.